We're here for the Zeppos Report, and what a great guest we have today. This is kind of a homecoming for me. Uh, my good friend and former colleague, Barry Friedman, the uh, Jacob Fuchsberg professor at NYU Law School. Barry, you have appointments, I assume, in political science and other fields as well. And it's just great to be with you today. It's really, really great to have you as a guest here. It's good to see you, Nick. It's been a long, long time we've known each other. Very yeah, long. 31 years, 31 years. And I uh, wouldn't be the chancellor, I wouldn't be a professor. So if you have any complaints, <laughs> send them to Barry. It's all because of Barry. Barry, um, you know, I followed your career, and you've written about so many different areas. And we can talk about a number of them because they touch so much on your latest work. But how did you go about writing this book, this wonderful book, uh, uh, unwarranted policing without permission. What was your inspiration for the book? You know, after 9-11, uh, everybody was talking about how we had to crack down on things. And, you know, I was as concerned as anybody was, but I wondered what they meant. And so I'd ask people, what do you think the police or the government should be able to do now that they can't? And if people could tell me anything, I'd say to them, they can already do that. The Supreme Court said they could do it a long time ago. And people would be shocked. And I realized that there was very little awareness of what the government and the police do out in society. And uh, so I had the idea, and then it took me about seven years to figure out sort of the angle that I wanted to take, and I got going. Did you spend um, time kind of – you live in Greenwich Village, right? True. So did you spend time kind of on the ground talking to police officers and talking to citizens? Kind of what was your – kind of on-the-ground, almost ethnographic work that you undertook for the book? Because I think that's the fundamental insight of the book. It's, it's we the people. Right. We are, we, we are not involved in policing enough. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I, you, know, you know I've started this policing project at NYU, and I spend huge parts of my days now with police officials, whether it's rank and file or police chiefs, departments all over the country, uh, but during writing the book, I didn't. I talked to a lot of people, but I didn't talk to police, which I regret in a way. Uh, but I think it allowed me to write the book in a certain way, though in the sort of polishing part of the book, I'd started working with law enforcement. Barry, what about, um, you know, if we, if we kind of think about your critique of the policing in America, um, you seem to say that in many ways, it's the fault of the people, kind of what we'd call democracy demos, and that the police are kind of eager for better training and better engagement and better community relations. What have we as the people done to really abdicate our responsibility here? So you're dead on. Uh, we, you know, I say at the beginning of the book that there are uh, to the extent I'm pointing a finger, there are two places I'm pointing it, and it is not at the police. Now, the book is full of one story after another, policing gone off the rails, so it's not that I'm not critical of policing. Uh, but the judges have let us down, and we've let ourselves down. We have, for sort of odd historical reasons, never taken control of the police, and we've left them to kind of, you know, we say, enforce the law, keep crime rates down, and then they just do it the way that they want to do it. And uh, the result has been a lot of the things that we've seen in the news over the last few years. Does it surprise you that, um, you know, we would tend to see these uh, challenges that you discuss or the uh, kind of uh, large gaps in accountability you discuss in what we would consider largely urban blue areas? The way policing has worked in this country is that we elect a mayor, Mayors run on keeping places safe. Mayors appoint police chiefs. And so the whole dynamic is keep us safe and nobody asking any questions. And it really has only been uh, in recent years, whether it's stop and frisk in New York or the events in Ferguson, that people have started to tune in and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to notice what's happening with policing. Do you um, find looking at policing in from your vantage point of law and policy and then you know, social science data, that it really is discriminatory based on race and class. 
Yeah, I think it's very, very difficult to miss the fact that race and class have a huge impact on how we're policed. Now, uh, it's important to realize that that's not completely true. And one of the messages in the book is this can happen to you. And, I, and the book is full of plenty of folks that are, you know, well-to-do folks who have terrible things happen to them. Uh, and it's also the case that when you move from street policing, use of force, stop and frisk, to surveillance, that it's much more pervasive in society, infecting everybody, and in part is affecting the dynamic around policing. But yes, there's just been certainly one study after another that shows disparate racial effects. And, you know, they're perverse sometimes. For example, if you look at police stops, uh, the police will be stopping disproportionately high numbers of minorities but finding less than they are with white drivers. And so that tells you that there's some sort of, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious bias going on. And the theory today is that there's just a lot of unconscious racial bias. How much of uh, this, particularly the, the bias, related to what we'd call war on drugs? Uh, and how much of the law has really empowered uh, um, stop and frisk and, you know, pat downs and oh, your taillight is uh, 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 out, open your trunk, what's in the glove compartment. How much of that is really related to drug policy and then what leads then to over-incarceration of African Americans? Yeah, it's, you know, it's been a war on drugs and then, of course, a war on terror and uh, asset forfeiture, which is a big part of the war on drugs, which says that if the police... Uh, you know, find an automobile or something that's been involved in the drug trade at all, then they can seize it. And those, they get a percentage of that. So it creates these very troubling incentives for the police to ramp up the stops because it could be a money-making endeavor for police departments. And so that's driven an enormous amount of it. And, you know, you mentioned taillights. I've been on a taillight rant the last few days because if oh, you stop... Oh, good. I, I hit, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. listen, if you think about it, I mean, Tail lights are lights. They yeah. go out. Right. Uh, nobody's at fault. They burn out at some yeah. point, just like your flashlight or anything else. Well, and the other thing is you get all these signals from your car that you think you're flying a, <laughs> a jet and it's tail light out. And I've gotten to the point where my systems are so bad, I ignore the tail light out. Well, even, like, so you know, I wait for the police to pull me over, maybe. Suppose that you you know you don't ignore the signal and you know that the tail light's out and the tail light's gone out at eight o'clock at night. It's right. not like there are tail light replacement shops, right. you know, twenty four hour tail light. Yeah. So people get stopped. I Maybe a, Starbucks could start one. <laughs> you know, or or Crystal. <laughs> the uh, uh, there's a very prominent lawyer in Florida that I know who tells a story about you know being stopped by a cop uh, when his family had been out to dinner and the tail light was out and the cop came up and said you know. Can you tell me where you've been? And he's thinking in his head, do I have to tell him that? I mean, my taillight's out. I didn't commit a major offense here. My taillight's out. And so he says, you know, we were out to dinner. So then the question is, well, did you have anything to drink? And so then, you know, you either lie or you don't. You're out of the car. And uh, and so this is pervasive. And as you point out, uh, this is often called proactive policing, which is that you use traffic stops. And cops will tell you they can stop anybody for something. Right. if they, Yeah, you know, it's a thousand laws. Uh to then say, you know, do you mind if I look in the glove compartment? Do you mind if right. I look in the trunk? And so, and very unproductive, I'll just tell you. The numbers on that is is startling. The hit rate is very, very low on anything like that. Really? Yeah. How much do you think we as a society have given up on core privacy, even apart from 9-11 issues that... That's just the price of buying 500 boxes for something from Amazon. So, you know, what I point out all the time and I think is super important is that we are living in a world where we give up our location, we give up a lot of information about ourselves to private companies. But private companies are different than the government. You know, Amazon and Apple are not going to come pick you up in the middle of the night, and the government might. And so what I think is that we all need to be very serious about strict controls on what information the government has and how the government uses that information. Right. But um, do you think that our attitude toward the government, do you think people draw a clear distinction in their mind between what I'm giving out generally and just more general concepts of privacy? 
So I think they're starting to, and it's actually interesting. It's geographically based in a sense. So I find, for example, that folks out west care a lot more about surveillance and electronic surveillance than folks out east. Uh, but you've started to see in a few jurisdictions exactly what I would you know, recommend in the book, which is that we get involved in policing on the front end. And so jurisdictions like Oakland have created privacy boards. Uh, and there's an ordinance that was just introduced in city council in New York, the NYPD is not thrilled about it, that says you have to have surveillance impact statements. Whenever you're going to introduce a new technology, you have to put it on your website, tell us the impact is going to be, give us some time to comment, uh, basically notice and comment rulemaking, mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then be responsive to those comments. So there's, I think there's greater concern about this, uh, and, and I think that's incredibly appropriate. Yeah, I'm um, surprised at uh, the way in which people give up information that, you know, you know, in reality is, you know, say targeted toward buying a new sweater, but yet they might not be drawing the connection that a lot of information, SSNs and consumer preferences and you can, it's like the old case on searching garbage. You yeah. know, you can really put together a pretty strong sense of how do you live and what are your political views and, you know, what is your thoughts about the government from just buying a bunch of clothes and things like that? It's, it's remarkable. I mean, you know, people will tell you that, so there's this distinction drawn between metadata, you know, what phone number did you call and the content, what was said on the call. And, you know, back in the day, what people wanted was to read the emails and know what was said on the call. But, you know, now it's all about knowing your location and knowing when you made the call. And, and you can make cases and put together people's lives like that. I mean, Justice Sotomayor said it in the Jones case. Uh, and in fact, you know, the one, the one coming crisis of constitutional law is the third party doctrine. So the third party doctrine says any information I give up to anybody else, the government can get it without a warrant, without probable cause, whether it's your, your bank, your tax accountant. That rule may never have made any sense, but everything about us is sitting in the hands of third parties now. The government doesn't have to come search our homes anymore. And so there's this enormous pressure on that doctrine, and Congress is locked up and can't figure out what to do about it, and the courts are just you know, struggling. So that's we got to figure that out. And uh, you do see uh, – let me, let me go at it in a different way – when um, assume there's a legitimate interest in searching a cell phone and uh, what do you think of third parties kind of saying we're not turning over our codes to the government? What, what do you think is the responsibility? Does their intellectual property or their privacy in algorithms trump? a legitimate warrant from the government? Because yeah. it's it's odd that somebody is fighting about my rights in a case that I'm not a party to, and I worry about that as well, but then is somebody above the law because they have basically collected all this information and what's their responsibility? I mean, this is the fight that we have going on right now with the director of the FBI, James Comey, worrying about going dark and the encrypt, you know, encryption. And then we've, of course, been reading about how the CIA has figured out how to hack into our, our phones. So there's basically an arms race going on around technology where uh, private tech companies, since Edward Snowden, and in response to consumer demand, are trying to make our technology safe, and the government relentlessly is trying to crack in. I, I've felt, so you know I've started this policing project at NYU Law School, and one of the things I want us very much to do is gather together leaders from tech and law enforcement and civil liberties groups uh, and activists and get, get folks in a room and close the door, because I think you can't always figure out questions like this in a heated public debate. Everybody gets on their side and just screams at each other, and really have a serious conversation about the rules. I mean, the one thing that I think is important uh, I have a piece out in the Washington Post today about, about um, cost-benefit analysis of policing practices, and I start it by saying, you know, to look at the debate, you'd think, you know, people are pro-cop, anti-cop, some people want to be safe, and everybody else just welcomes Armageddon. But that's ridiculous. Every one of us wants to be safe. I mean, every, every single one of us, wherever we are on these issues, we want ourselves and our families to be safe. 
but we also want to have some core of privacy. And so it's tough. But, but, but you know, reasonable people are supposed to be able to get in a room and say, let's try to figure it out. Right. Do you see, uh, you know, your book looks at Snowden, metadata, and lo at local pol policing practices. Do you see at the local level the same kind of appetite and interest in metadata in the transfer of data from CIA, whether it's CIA, DIA, FBI, whatever the sources, are the local police showing interest in that? And do you worry about them becoming an arm of a national security apparatus? Yeah, there's huge worries about this. And, you know, it, how much the local jurisdiction is dealing with these issues depends on how large it is and how sophisticated. So, you know, s Chicago, for example, which has had a terrible trouble with violence, is quite sophisticated in its use of social media tools to track what's happening on social media, predictive policing, uh, other departments maybe less so. But even there, you know, the, the I mean, which you, you know, most people don't know is that their cell phone company to whom they're paying money every month is also making money f answering requests from government agencies for the data. And I tell, a, you know, in passing in the book, a story about uh, one company that's just, you know, marketing this, like they're bringing in law enforcement as a profit area for them. And so, uh, we should all be very concerned, and it's really tough to regulate. I mean, it's really, you know, doing this at, at, at each node at the local level is expensive and complicated. Well, you have written so much about judicial review. Um, your book, The Will of the People, is a, a seminal work. Um, what role do the courts have here? And are we getting to the point where um, you either get a local judge, as you had in New York, kind of putting the whole thing in receivership, or you have the Supreme Court trying to articulate principles, but yet they don't understand local conditions. What's Are we seeing courts, and maybe it's kind of, you know, something you would accept, which is, yeah, I mean, the courts are not the only actor. Are they playing a diminishing role, Barry, or what's the role of of, of, of the local uh, uh, judicial system and then our federal system, particularly at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, I mean, they actually play a huge role. And what has took too long to dawn on me, but you know, we've lived in this world for a long time, is it seems normal to us to think, well, policing, the Supreme Court will govern that, we'll have Fourth Amendment principles. And then you, you know, you spend time with a sophisticated or even a less sophisticated policing agency, and it shouldn't be a shock. Policing's complicated, and there's a lot of technologies, and there's a lot of tactics, and there's a lot of training. Uh, it's a hard business, and the idea that you know we would run that—I mean, name a, an industry sector that you would run with two or three Supreme Court decisions as your set of rules. It, it's ridiculous. I mean, you need policing needs rules like everything else, uh, and judges are ill-positioned to to give us those rules. They don't know about the inner workings of policing. They realize that if they ban something, it's just flat out banned, and that may be a terrible idea, so they tend to err in favor of allowing the police to do things. Once the courts say it's not unconstitutional, everybody figures it's fine, and there's this expression now among police officials that, you know, certainly in light of all the officer-involved shootings, which is lawful but awful which is sure, it passes muster under the Supreme Court's test, but it's not what any of us would ever want to see. And so, uh, you know, we could talk about examples like the shooting of Tamir Rice, but things, things like that are examples of why we need democratic rules governing policing that says this is how we want to be policed, this is the, the tactics and technologies we're comfortable with, and, you know, can't expect the judges to do that for us. Right, particularly given the lack of uniformity that if the police make a rule, if the Supreme Court makes a rule for the national police practice, what New York might think or what a small town in Minnesota might think, those are two very different areas, but you think the court has a role. Does the court still have a role in kind of, you know, drawing clearer lines, you know, you say if they say it's unacceptable, it's unacceptable, but yet I think you and other people would, including probably Justice Scalia, would say we've kind of gotten rid of the warrant requirement a lot in cases that we would expect a warrant. Right. So and I know, might be wrong about the justices, but 
that seems an area where we've really migrated to an administrative bureaucratic approach to here are a bunch of conditions, and if everything looks okay, you can do it. You don't have to get a warrant. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the problem with judges is that they view things after the fact. And a lot of times when they see something, the police have caught a bad guy. And the bad guy may be saying you violated the Constitution, but, you know, the bad guy's sitting there with two kilos of heroin. And so it's, right. you know, and, and you have to realize from the perspective of courts, cops look like geniuses because the cops keep coming in with a bad guy. What the courts never see are all the times that the cops used exactly the same tactic and didn't find anything. And if they had that whole picture, any sensible regulator would say, you know, I need, I need to look at this differently. But you ask a super astute question, Nick, which is, you know, what's the right role of judges? Well, the subtitle of the book is Policing Without Permission. And, you know, as we've been discussing, one view of permission is democratic authorization. But warrants are a form of permission as well. I mean, that's, you know, warrants are hugely sensible, which is to say, Look, a cop's hot on the chase. We want them to be hot on the chase. We want them to be mission-oriented. But then before they go into your house, maybe it's great if they, you know, called somebody up and said, I'm going to go in the house. This is why I'm going to do it. And the person on the other end could say, well, let me ask a couple questions about that. And then bless it if it's appropriate to be blessed. And so I think that's an important thing courts have done, could do. I think another important thing that courts can do is take probable cause seriously, which they have not. Uh, they've kind of let the standards slip. And then, as you know, I talk in the book a great deal about, about kind of the new policing and what courts need to do to address that. What about, um, you know, I think one of the fundamental insights of your book is that this is a large, complex area of human interaction that is without a lot of guidelines needing to make decisions kind of instantly, but we could do a better job of running it as transparent with some guidelines that are building local accountability. Did you find that, were you surprised at how many rules there are for conditions on the ground or the absence of limits on discretion at the, at the, at, and I'd almost call the necessity of the officer making a decision. What did, what did you discover? Yeah, you know, people talk a lot about the discretion that officers have to exercise, and they do. And I'll tell you, one thing I've learned from riding around in police cars is I am not cut out to be a cop. I mean, it is an incredibly difficult job, and it involves dealing with people under tense situations and trauma and people who are ill and have drug addiction problems. And I, I mean, it's just ex it's an extremely difficult job. And, and you do have to exercise your discretion. But that doesn't mean we can't cabinet. We do that everywhere in law. We have rules that give people guidance. The military, I mean, you know, we, we have very clear rules about how to behave. So I'll give you an example. I just mentioned Tamir Rice. Let's just talk about Tamir Rice for a second. Right. So, you know, the Cleveland PD gets a call that there's a male in a park with a gun. And that goes out through dispatch to the officers. And dispatch is also told that it might be a young man or a kid and it might be a toy gun, but that never gets to the officers. So the officers go pulling up. I mean, you've seen the video, and they get to within a few feet of him, and one of the officers jumps out, and with two seconds, he fires, and Tamir Rice is on the ground. They cower behind the car because they don't have medical support and think he's armed. Eventually, EMS shows up, and it's two ladies dead. Uh, well, the Supreme Court's way of understanding that is that we ask the question, at the time that the officers used the force, was it objectively reasonable? Now, it may or may not have been objectively reasonable. You could quibble about that. But you could see an argument that it possibly could be, and a grand jury did not indict in that situation. However, if you talk to police officials who, who understand how things ought to be done properly, they all ask the same question. This is kind of that, you know, maybe lawful but awful, which is, why did they go flying up to Tamir Rice in their car? Right. You know, what? Yeah, that's what I think is the question, which is, you know, it's like the old Talking Heads song, how did they get there? I mean, it's kind of like, okay. And again, we have to understand that they're making split-second decisions. And we don't know if there's a party in the park, a birthday party, but yet, are there better ways to, to kind of guide the engagement? Yes, I mean, they sh you know. And, and collect information, even though it's on site, to make what you'd call a better decision. Time and distance, it isn't rocket science. And any good chief would tell you, you use time and distance to avoid using force. So there wasn't a party in that park. Right. There was no reason. No, there was no reason. No reason. And, 
I mean, the cops put themselves in Jeopardy's way uh, or potentially in a Jeopardy's way. You pull back, you, you know, you pull out a megaphone, you, you say, you know, drop the weapon, put your hands in the air, you go up and investigate, and you learn that there's a kid with a toy gun who not, should not be dead today. And there are countless instances of that, whether it's on the technology side or the force side, the stop and frisk side, where, you know, again, with all credit to wanting to be safe and to the tough job that cops do, we could write finer grained rules that would actually make them more effective, make them safer, and have policing happen in a way that we want. And that's what we need to do. Do you, um, we worry about large databases being the source of invasions of privacy. Um, we worry about them as um, being used for targeting, but is there a way to use data to actually give police better guidance? So that if you looked at X number encounters, you'd see Y number of results. It's like you talked about what is the yield on, you know, kind of broken taillight, broken window policing. Yeah. Does it really yield anything? And so could large data sets, Barry, be, you know, nine times out of 10, it leads to an encounter and a confrontation that leads to a death when we can say there probably was not a reason to do that. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is not a surprising story to anybody living in the world today, which is that technology is a two-edged sword, and we have to be worried about large databases and what's in those data databases about us, and yet, you know, there's machine learning and predictive policing algorithms that are developing, and they're, they're definitely not there yet. But, you know, eventually they will be better at targeting who might be the folks we need to be worrying about out on the street or the areas, you know, hotspots for policing. And, uh, and you know, this just brings up, again, my, my relentless point that we need to be involved because that stuff can go really off the rails. You know, it depends what you're doing with the information. You could be targeting the wrong people and just making assumptions about them. But it also might improve our capacity to target the right people and leave everybody else alone. So there's hope there, but there's danger there. There's concern that the algorithms will use information that's already been accumulated in racially biased right, ways. Right, which will lead to racially biased outcomes and over-policing of, of neighborhoods with... Um, certain demographic and socioeconomic factors. What, um, how do you, um, and have you seen any successful models where, you know, people will say, well, you know, we put the police where the crime is and try to, by presence or intervention, reduce crime. But yet, those areas might be the, they might not be the high crime areas, and they might also be the areas where there's the least trust of the police. So you're kind of dealing with a situation like, well, we got to go there because we think there's a lot of crime there. And many people would say, well, there's, maybe if you think there's crime there, it's because the police aren't trusted in the community. How do you build that trust? Does your model include engagement and dialogue and rule writing and then outreach in communities to really develop a trusting relationship. Um, because I think that's one of the huge questions here. Yeah, you know, we're, we, so yes, we're, we're working all over the country. We're in Cleveland and in Camden and in Tampa and Tucson. We did a big project in New York. We we're doing a big project on body cameras in LA right now. Uh, on the question of when video should be released after an officer-involved shooting. We are, we, you know, I'm hoping that we go into Chicago and do a project very much on the ground. And, and that is exactly what we do, which is we try to figure out what are the models to give the community voice in how it's policed. And, you know, one of the problems in this country is that we have two conversations completely separate from one another that is completely untenable. So we worry about crime and we talk about crime and what needs to be done to fight crime, which is where the focus is of the current administration. Uh, and then we have a conversation about policing tactics, stop and frisk technology. But the two 
conversations have to come together. Right. You know, some of the neighborhoods that you're talking about, whether these trust issues, also have serious crime issues. And one of their equal complaints is we're both over policed and under policed. Yeah, at the same time. Right. So, you know, how do you tackle that? I, our goal, our model, and we haven't quite gotten there yet in any particular place, but we're edging there, is where there are folks around the table having the conversation that needs to be had fair, in fairness to everyone, which is that, you know, the community says, well, we don't like the crime. And the cops say, OK, but you don't like stop and frisk. And can you tell us what you think we should be doing? I don't know what comes out of that conversation, but I'm going to bet you good common sense comes out of that conversation, that the people that are living with the crime will have ideas about how to go after the crime that are sensible and don't, you know, inflict the community with over-policing the way that we've seen it. You know, the founders didn't really like a standing army. And I'm teaching my Federalist Papers class. Um, I brought the play Hamilton into it, you know, because these kids are fascinated by Hamilton. You know, I was obsessed with Hamilton uh, early in our career, so I'm teaching you that Fisk. It's too bad you didn't write that play. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, I know. But um, I've got a pretty good job, though, as it is. Um, Most politicians are never going to say, you know what? All in all, the security threat to America is not as great as it was, and maybe it's declining, and crime is actually declining. So is there just a hydraulic political appetite for crime is on the rise, it's getting worse than ever, nobody is safe in the streets? How do we talk to the politicians um, about... You know, we understand politics is not social science, but there's got to be some recognition of what is an improvement. And when you see, you know, declines in crime in certain areas or improvements, isn't it important to change the rhetoric and say, well, what worked in Philadelphia? And... Is, is that a city that's had decline in crime? And what worked, but what maybe worked at the cost of certain communities? But are politicians ever going to get there? So, uh, you know, I don't know if you watch Homeland, but the storyline in Homeland this season is, <coughs> obviously was written before the election, was a, you know, progressive woman president who says the way we've been fighting terrorism is going over the top. And, and I, I wrote a play about Vanderbilt winning the SEC basketball tournament. So, you know, <laughs> you know you, how that feels. You, yeah, yeah, I got uh, that wrong, but we came close. Uh, so did the the woman, progressive women, run, woman running for president. And so, and uh, so, in the piece I have in the post today, I, I argue that we really need to focus a lot more on cost benefit analysis. That we we do this pervasively throughout government, environmental regulation, workplace safety. You know, we try to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. And it's not easy, and it's particularly difficult around policing, but we don't do it. And in fact, I, I, in response to that piece, which is up on the web, I've gotten a lot of criminologists that have written me kind of annoyed, saying, well, but we are doing this stuff. And so they're sending me papers, so I'm busy trying to keep up with the papers yep. they're sending. And I need to write them all back to say, no, you're actually not doing it, because what, here's what you're not all doing. So you know, let's think about stop and frisk. It's interesting. Does stop and frisk work? There have been some studies. They're com- completely inconclusive. You know, even if it were constitutional, it was happening. They're inconclusive about whether it's helped remove guns from the street, about whether it's reduced crime. But what no study, Nick, I'm telling you literally no study with one tiny exception of a drunk driving roadblock study, ever asks, I mean, I've been, my jaw's been on the ground about this for a couple of years now, is what are the social costs of doing this kind of policing? I, I, you know, nobody's ever said, like, what is, how do we, what, what would we monetize? You know, what would you be willing to pay to not be tossed against a wall and have yourself frisked, right? Is it $100? Because if it's $100 in New York in one year, we did that to 300,000 people. So that's $30 million. Did we get $30 million of gain? I don't know, but that's the question to ask. Yeah, that's really shocking because, you know, that's the, the kind of conundrum they used to face in environmental law, which is, okay, well, you know, you're going to lose X jobs, but the red cockaded woodpecker or the spotted owl can't be seen, we can't put a value on that. You have to, what you're arguing is that people really haven't put a value on fundamental constitutional rights or social fabric. What is the cost? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you could say to people, 
you know, you're coming home at 11 o'clock at night and you know, you're going to be stopped and frisked and maybe taken to the prison, what would you ask to be paid for that inconvenience? Right. Now, you might not get real verdicts, but you might get a pretty good number that says, you know, it's kind of a mathematical version of the old let better that nine guilty go free than one innocent be convicted. I mean, that's kind of a cost-benefit analysis right there that has a heavy thumb on the side of liberty, doesn't it? Yeah, and you don't have to put the thumb anywhere. I mean, that's the interesting thing. You could you could put your thumb wherever you want, Yeah. but it would be interesting if you first had some data to start putting it so that you could say, you know, that's the question I just asked you, which is if you just pick a number, I don't know if $100 is the right number for being stopped and frisked, and there were 300,000 of them, and so that's $30 million. And you just I think say, you'd find a lot of people put a lot higher than a hundred bucks. Just, I'm just tossing out yeah. a round number. Particularly you know, right? yeah. at certain zip codes. Well, and you know, those zip codes don't really know what it looks like. So, you know, that and that's part of the empirical challenge, which is when you're doing willingness to pay analysis, how right, do people right. really understand wealth what's, effects, yeah. Yeah, what's at stake? But uh, but there are a lot, you know, as you say, in, environmental science had to figure out how to value a human life. And, right. you know, at first when they started to do it, people said, well, that's nuts. And that's the distance cruel. was huge right. Right, and cruel. But, you know, we've gotten to a point where we kind of have consensus. Plug can, for Kip Viscusi down yeah, in my law school. Well, I, I just had a conference at, at uh, NYU in the middle of a blizzard, methodologists from all over the country who came to talk about how we apply all these tactics to policing. And I tried to get Kip to come, but he wouldn't come. So you might speak to him next <laughs> That's time. That's because he knew there was a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> why, would you, why would you travel to a blizzard? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, you might as well go skiing in Aspen <laughs> if you're going to have that. The restaurants are, are accessible. <laughs> I'll tell you one interesting thing about this, which is, so we, on this cost-benefit project that we're running at the Policing Project, we, uh, we're partnering with the Police Foundation, and the Laura and John Arnold Foundation funded us to do a two-year study where we'd get the methodologists together and talk about tactics, and then we'd actually try to do kind of back-of-the-envelope uh, CBAs on some policing stuff. And through the Police Foundation, we had three sets of conference calls with police officials at every level, from sort of lieutenants and captains up to chiefs, saying... What would you like a cost-benefit analysis of? And you want the you want to know what the answer was? Everything. Yeah. They are so Their time cur- right too. They, they, they want to know whether right. they whether they should hire officers at overtime right. or new right. officers. Whether right. they should use drones to map traffic accidents. Whether they should be using stop and frisk. Is de-escalation training right. worth it? I mean. It was totally admirable, right? They're, right? they're just like, we have budgets. We've right. got all this technology. We have to decide whether to invest in it or not. We do not have any information. And so right. I really believe that, that that this is a way to transform policing by asking, you know, I'm sure to you, it seems like the most obvious question on the planet, which is, do we know what works and at what cost? And can we at least start to have a conversation right. about that? You know, it's kind of basic regulatory cost-benefit analysis, which is I don't have unlimited resources, so I have limited resources. How do I allocate those resources to produce the most societal benefits? Right. And we've not done that. And I would think that um, particularly in times of fiscal constraint, you know, the, the local uh, police chief and the lieutenants and the officers would be attracted to a uh, kind of, well, give us good information so we're allocating ourselves – in the most effective and efficient way. Yeah, and civic officials, you know, there are things like Shot Spotter, which tells the police when a gunshot's been fired, which they need because the community trust is eroded enough that nobody calls the cops when a gunshot's been fired in certain areas. And Shot Spotter's extremely expensive. Now, it may be a terrific idea, Mm -hmm. but, you know, this is what mayors and city councils and city managers have to be asking, which is, do we tech up for the license plate readers? Do we get the facial recognition? Do we get the shot spotter? Do we do de-escalation training of the entire force? Do we specially train officers to deal with the mentally ill? I mean, there's all these questions, and you and I are paying for it. We're all paying for it. And we all want to be safe, but we all want to be safe in a fiscally sound way. And that's yeah. just not a question we ask. No, it's it's like the old um, the old comment, The first, what's the first thing you say to the police officer when you're pulled over. Is this the best thing you have to do to make our community safe? Right. Well, you did a rolling stop. It's 3 a.m. Is this the, so? And maybe it is. Again, I'm not up at 3 a.m., but, but that is kind of fundamental to what most people think, which is 
I'm, why are you doing this here instead of there? And then the people where they're doing it, they're not asking this, is this producing a social benefit and is it actually helping the community? Right, that's right. Yeah. So um, are you pessimistic or optimistic about um, you know the kind of next five years on this project and kind of changing things? So you know me. I'm I'm optimistic by nature. Yeah. I uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, have started the policing project and wouldn't keep getting up every morning when I could be just sitting and having my latte and working on yet another law review article, trying to figure out how to bring police departments and communities on board without thinking that you could make a difference. And and you know the we're pretty early in it still. We had a lot of faith placed in us by communities and departments, uh, but you get these magic moments of connection. And you realize, you know, think about it this way, Nick. And I think about it this way a lot. So I've, I've been on a ride along in Brownsville, which is a tough area in New York. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've, where they're chasing uh, somebody that's running around with a gun. And they've, you know, the police have created a perimeter and the choppers are overhead. And the community is jeering at them. Mm -hmm. And I think, wouldn't it, you know, I know this is a little 1950s and Andy of Mayberry, but wouldn't it be nicer to go to work? where people were waving at you and happy to see you. And on both sides, wouldn't it be a better world? And I, I just, at, at the quick, I mean, you do know me, at the quick, I believe that. And yeah. that's what we're trying to accomplish, is let's, yeah. let's get there. Yeah. Well, I have tremendous admiration and respect for you, Barry. Thanks for taking this on, and thanks for coming on the Zeppos Report. Thank you, Nick. It's been great to be here.